Florida, can you hear me? Okay. How was the review session? It was great, except for David's part. <laughs> so we just have to fire David and we'll be left with a zero. Is that what you want? <laughs> I mean, you said it. <laughs> <laughs>
I think we have gone over about 10 minutes overall. David, is that right? And so we, we will aim to give you back your time. Uh, you may not get all of it back today, but maybe you'll get a couple. Um, so today's lecture and Wednesday's lecture focuses uh, pretty obsessively over one topic. We're just going to talk about indoles. And you may say, Phil, this is really um, reckless of you to spend a whole three hours on uh, one heterocycle. But it is actually kind of important that you understand all the ways and, and, and methods of making indoles because it's all about optionality. I mean, if you want to skip ahead to the consulting question and look at it, uh, that's typically what, I mean, that's probably 20% of the questions I'll get is that kind of thing. And if you only know one way to make uh, something, you're going to be in a little bit of trouble. So uh, we need to know a thousand ways to make indoles. And uh, we won't cover all of them. The assumption is that you have spent some time looking at the book, the Starburst, uh, maybe the cheat sheet. I see some of you have laminated sheets. And so instead of starting off in the way where we go through all the ways of making indoles and then go to case studies, I thought that the better way to present this also in particular because a lot of people already know a lot about indulge from natural product chemistry, is to go straight to case studies and strategy. How do we think about breaking these things apart in very, various different contexts? And in the usual way, we'll talk about medchem, process, and even radiochem. So with that, uh, let's begin with the first uh, one. This one comes from Wyeth. And uh, when looking at this molecule, before we think about in the core, we should probably think about the innate reactivity and how that helps us to immediately truncate portions of the molecule. So we, we do have the indole team, which I believe is uh, made up of uh, Saul and Zhang. And uh, we also have uh, Florida. Alex in Florida? Is that right? Yeah. OK. So. We'll need, we'll need you, you folks a lot today. Uh, but in the meantime, are there parts of the structure that you look at before even thinking about the indole that you can take advantage of the innate reactivity to immediately simplify the molecule? It's super easy to burn off the nitrile, and it's super easy to make the dihydropyran by adding oxygen in the microorganism or fashion. So which bonds do you want to break? Here and here? Oh, sorry. Uh, between the quad center and the oxygen. And then uh, you, what do you want to have here? So where I'm going is... Some sort of Michael addition, you said? You can do Michael addition to form the CO bond. Uh -huh. And you can easily do like a C2 vinyl cross-coupling to... So let's put a bromine there as a placeholder. And um, this is a really good point. So we've got a, a trip to fall of some sort. And now we need to recapitulate what Saul wants as the electrophile. And so he's suggesting that. Is that right? Or I guess you could just do that chemistry and you know, look at it. Right, you can get rid of the X. All right. Anything wrong with that? Do, do you think you have uh, fully taken advantage of... And, you know, the way I think about this is that um, when you do cross-coupling, it is, it is an instinctual reflex as a modern chemist, but the hope is that in this class you will dial it back a little bit from the cross-coupling logic. Just the idea is that if you take advantage of innate reactivity of all the heterocycles you're learning, you don't have to be so reliant upon palladium. The advantage of this approach is you can start from trip to fall, right? If you yep. take advantage of innate reactivity, you probably have to build the indole. Well, what other innate reactivity can I take advantage of that doesn't require me to use palladium? 
What's that? C3 alkylation. C3 alkylation. Oh, you mean you want to, you want to go here and then rearrange it there? Yeah. And what kind of chemistry is that usually called? Like Pictet Spengler. It would be like Pictet Spengler. So Pictet Spengler would require the corresponding NH2 there. And as Max says, it would indeed go through C3, but tryptophols have very similar reactivity. And so it is possible to just take that, where, why don't we just keep where x is equal to h. And innately, this thing is going to want to couple to the key. You don't like a salt. I've never had good luck with Big Spangler chemistry, especially in pyranal systems. Oh, well, this one works well. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, we can go back retrospectively to those Wyeth guys and tell them they had it all wrong. But w w the point here is that um, you need to strategically be aware of this. Because this one, you just take the beta keto ester, you take the tryptophol, you heat it up with acid, and pretty cleanly get out the product. Now, let's not talk about asymmetry for now. I mean, Saul's approach is not going to help you with asymmetry either. But the point is, you can very rapidly make the scaffold from a, a library of beta keto esters and uh, tryptophol. Treat it with a little bit of acid, whatever your favorite acid is. And you'll get out the desired product. So our, our conundrum then becomes, how do we make that? Could you just check the indole of like ethylene oxide in the same sort of fashion? So uh, Max would like to take this compound and bring it down from some sort of alkylation of it, whether it's ethylene oxide or maybe it's a Frito craft followed by reduction, whatever. So one approach would be Some sort of alkylation of that. Now, how do we make that? Well, we're going to learn like a thousand ways to make that. Give me one. I think you like. Do you think you have to connect nitrogen? You can do like a C5. Uh, or is it C5? Oxidation. C4 or C4? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, not going to go there. That's a tough position to bromidate. You could what? Take the indole itself. You're going to have to make the indole itself, which really brings us to problem of the day number one, which is how they did it. So problem of the day number one uh, asks the question, what happens when you take this hydrazine and dihydrofuran and mix it together, first THF water, and then we're going to treat it with zinc chloride and heat. So maybe... Someone on, what do you say there, Zhang, uh, as one of the indole team folks? Maybe you can guide us through this. Okay, great. So we've hydrated, or, yeah, there's a hydration that takes place in C2, and then that you form the hemi aminal. And that really is the equivalent of to make your life easier, Zhang, you can just leave the substituents off for now. Just worry about the aromatic for sure. That's really hard to like actually write the. Stuff. Yeah, the grad office only has the old iPads. <laughs> did, they, did, the, did the old ones work with the Apple Pencil? No. No.
Okay, so he's got that key intermediate. Let's draw that. And then he's drawing 3-3. Three, three. Now, why don't you uh, let see when you're almost done? Yeah, finish drawing that intermediate thing. Great. Why don't you do us a favor there, Zeng? What is, what is this compound here? Hide it. Um. What is just? What is this? And our friends in the pyrrole world, Max and Max, can tell us that that is the recipe for how to make furans, pyrroles, all of it. Thing. What is this called? Fisher. This is Fisher. This is the first, first indole synthesis. Fisher indole synthesis pretty important. It's probably <clears throat> one of the most popular ways of making indoles. One of them. Still today. Okay, great. Let's take a look at this compound from Merck. And we need to have a cage match of the medicinal chemist versus the process chemist. And you can decide which one you like better. But the medicinal chemist uh, sort of looked at this compound and paid no attention to the chirality in terms of controlling it in an absolute sense. They just cared about getting the analog quickly. And so problem of the day number two is the medicinal chemistry approach where they simply take the hydrazine, they couple it with this ketone, and out pops, according to the problem of the day, three different products. So we need some help from someone. Uh, how about uh, in Florida? Because you mm -hmm. don't have the iPad, if you want to just talk us through it, I'll be your slave here. OK, so I guess starting from the hydrazine, it'll commence with the ketone, and then uh, tautomerize to the enamine and form the expected Fisher and Bull product. Hold on, you're going a little too fast for me. Uh, now you said draw the expected Fisher and Bull product. Is that what you said? Oh uh, no, you tautomerize to the enamine first. Oh. Uh, 
A or what B? What did you write? Uh, I got a, a little A here or a B here. What do you want me to put the olaf in? Um, I can't see the molecule, like the oh, can we product. Can in there for you? I mean the the target. Oh. Um, Uh, A? A? Okay. And 3-3. Three, three. And so after all the 3-3, uh, three, three, loss of ammonia, uh, you get out the product. Okay, but there's two other products, so what, what else are we going to do here? Uh, I mean, we're looking at B also. Okay, so if you get this one here, job to make an indole can't. So it stops there. But there's one more product there, Alex. Any any uh, ideas? alkyl does a 1-2 migration. There's really no driving force for the alkyl to do a 1-2 migration. Um, you know, because the migratory aptitude of a primary carbon in this type of system is not very good because the uh, you're going through, you have a pseudo carbocation, primary carbocation here, or alpha to a, a carbocation alpha to an ester. So it's really not going to move. It's just going to sit there. It's not going anywhere. Aha! Well, you don't need to condense first with the ester. I mean, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to make the hydrazine. But then you have it right. If you just count one, two, three, four, five. Oh, look at that. That's a problem. Uh, the yield is only like 10, 20 percent of the desired product, which for medicinal chemists is, you know, super. Get the, get the target, ask the biological question. Turns out it is a pretty good drug, so toss over to the, med, the uh, process chemist and let them figure it out. And uh, problem day number three is what the process chemists do when they need to make exactly this one compound. And so what they have done when they look at this is they say, you know what, we are going to delete, we're going to break here and try to introduce the chirality through one of the best ways we know how. In process, you're either going to do biocatalysis, you're going to do hydrogenation or something, uh, or you're going to do resolution. That's like 90%, and then 10% of some boutique methods. And so they reason that you know maybe this could arise from some sort of uh, displacement event of a chiral alcohol, which we'll get to in just a little while. You could also imagine this could come from some sort of hydrogenation. It's also perfectly fine. And as the first step of their route, they use a name reaction, which we haven't covered yet, a very, very useful way 
of making regioisomerically defined hydrozones. And that is problem of the day number three. So we need someone to help us, and uh, the last indole victim we haven't called on yet is Saul. So uh, if you want to call it out, I can again be your dutiful slave and draw out what you like. What, what do you want to do? Sorry? Make the aryl diazonium chloride on the bottom section. And then the alpha center, like the highly acidic one, will add into that. There you go. It's there. Super. So you may say, hey, Phil, why don't they just take a 1,2-cyclohexane diode and react with hydrazine? Because 1,2-cyclohexane diode is not very stable. And so often you'll use Jap Klingman if you need to get specifically one regioisomer of a hydrazone. Or if the starting materials that normally would get you there are not that stable. Or for synthetic eaves, as we'll see an example later on where it's just much easier to use Jack Klingman. Because, remember, this is a good, this malinate type system is a good alkylating subunit. So you can put whatever you want there, Jack Klingman it away, and get your hydrozone. Much easier than starting with a 1,2-dicarbonyl and then building from that, because those compounds are not so stable. To what extent are process chemists fine with diazonium chemistry? They're I mean, they're becoming, okay, so, I mean, like the question 20 years ago, they're A-OK -okay with it. And the question today, uh, with the sort of uh, more mainstream use of flow chemistry, it's not a problem. And often if you're going to, and if you want to do it in batch, you can do that too. What they would do is just evaluate the energetics of that intermediate diazonium. Make sure it doesn't explode. Make sure it's all, all good. And then still today you see people doing diazonium chemistry in batch. But if it is energetic and they're desperate, they might use a flow. So this is still modern strategy you can suggest and they won't look at you like you're crazy. Okay, so what happens next here, uh, Max? What do you say? Um, then I do a fissure. And then you get the, um, basically all, the entire carbon scales minus the uh, uh, pendant uh, alcohol or acid, the ketone is basically after that. Nice. And then they use one of their favorite uh, reducing agents. This is, uh, you can do this on metric ton scale. There's a couple of drugs that are still made with CVS reduction on scale, metric ton. And uh, then they use the Mitsunobu reaction. Nice acidity here on the malinate. And um, hydrolyze off one of the hydrolyze the acids to the acids, and then heat it up with acetic hydride. Get a very rapid decarboxylation, and uh, there's your product. Seven steps, asymmetric, no chromatography. So that's like a masterpiece. If you like process chemistry, I mean, if that appeals to you, you you know, in your head now, you're pretty much you should be interviewing for process jobs. Questions? Okay, let's talk about Les Call. Les Call was Novartis's uh, statin. You know, statins were all the rage uh, for many years because they were their blockbuster status. Les Call, I believe, was, I could be mistaken, but I believe it was taken off the market. It did have some idiosyncratic tox issues, maybe as a consequence of the indole. 
But let's think about the ways we might be able to put this thing together. Steve, any thoughts on this compound? Any general thoughts? So let's talk about the C2 position. There's a few options we have for the C2 position, aren't there? When you say C2, where do you want to disconnect? Uh, I would disconnect between the two SP2 carbons. OK. So we could certainly disconnect here. Is there another disconnection that you might use? When you're talking about the C2 area? I guess you could disconnect the N carbon bond as well. Well, we'll talk about N carbon later. Okay. But let's just focus on C2. We can talk about what you just said, which is disconnecting right there. You can also see two formally. And then. And, then, and then you can also imagine some sort of Wittig reaction here. So we'll call that the disconnection A, and we'll call this disconnection B. And uh, disconnection B is more what Steve is thinking, and then disconnection A is more what the medicinal chemists are thinking. And then let's draw out what the medicinal chemists are thinking. Now we need a good way to put that thing together. You said something about anisopropylation. Is that, is that what you said there, Steve? Uh, not exactly what I was thinking. But... You don't like anisopropylation? I mean, if you're a med chemist, you should like it. The yield is going to be pretty low. But what if I need, do you know what alkyl you're going to need there? You're going to need to make a diverse array. So for medicinal chemists, I would say this approach is pretty good just because you can take the ester down to the aldehyde. You can vitig all day with different side chains. You can n alkylate because you don't know what you're going to need. And now we just need to think, think of a way to make that. Let's make it easier and uh, remove this completely. There we go. Much easier. super fast way we can make this using something we just learned. You can draw the Fisher disconnect. Sorry? We could, we could draw the Fisher you disconnect. You can sure, surely draw a Fisher disconnection. Let's do that. compounds are, you, you, you can certainly make them. Um, what would be the best way to put that together, you think? Like what do you say they're done, then? Um, can I just connect between C2 and C3? Just, no, it goes through the see anything wrong with that. In fact, you can do this two different ways. You can do it the way he said, or you could use um, a Madelung approach. You know, it's known that these things will become acidic. You can deprotonate them. It's like a directed deprotonation, and they'll snap shut. So a Madelung approach, you can look on your cheat sheet, find that name reaction. You could probably, I'm um, not sure about Dungman's approach here, just because when you deprotonate that, it's very difficult to get this thing to deprotonate as well. This is like a vanilligous amide. So this is very acidic, and once you deprotonate here, adding nucleophiles to there becomes nearly impossible. So this one, I'm going to say, don't do it. But if we take... 
Dunman's logic further, the Madelung approach probably would work. But then how do we make that? You could say, oh, well, why don't you try Friel Crafts? Friel Crafts is probably going to go wrong, wrong regiochemistry, or at least give you a mixture of stuff. And Max, why are you not so confident with your Fisher? You don't like Fisher? Well, no, the Fisher looks fine. It's just the synthesis of the, uh, the starting materials is kind of. So what do we do when we have a problem making a particular hydrozone? Well, not so much that. Well, not well, so much what? Yeah. Well, I was it, thinking, would it be like too naive to just disconnect the over to like some like C3 halogenated indole? And then just do a cross-coupling approach for modularity there? Oh, you want to cross-couple. Uh, certainly not, not, not that idea at all. So let's, this area has strategically been placed for max. <laughs> Okay, so this guy can be brominated, and now we can Suzuki our way to drugs. How do we make this, Max? Um, I think you can disconnect uh, this CN bond. Uh, this one or this one? Um, no, the one with the, the, the ester next to it, yeah. There. And I forget the name, but I think that can go back to like a nitro uh, area. And then you can alkylate. Oh yeah, methyl nitroarine and alkylate the methyl group produce nitro and close on the carbon ions. Aha! He's invoking, what is this called? Is that one lime group or bacho? It's a lime group or batch go. <laughs> you remember McGruber? <laughs> you guys are too young, except SNL. Hannah knows, but yeah. Is that like old SNL? That's old <laughs> SNL, yeah. That used to be new SNL. Back in the 2013 heterocycles, everybody got that. <laughs> now, six years later, nobody knows what McGruber is. They made a movie. They made a movie, too? Yeah. All right. Well, some people know. That's good. You could certainly uh, do that. So this is a pretty acidic position, then. You can just alkylate it, close. Uh, there's tons of ways of making that. We're going to talk about a few. Many. Um, you, you could also... Again, go back to your I mean, that's commercial. Just dump and stir those together. It's going to work really well. But that begs the question, why not go back to your original disconnection you had there, Max? It's still pretty good. We just one problem with this. The one problem is you're having trouble making this. Aha! Uh -huh. So when you have problems making the hydrozone you want to make, just use Jap Klingman. So that would give us what they used as the acetyl, but it could be diester, it's fine. And the diazonium. And you'll get out the Fisher product. Just do a Jack Klingman. And the advantage of this one is now nobody has a problem making this anymore, right? It's just simple alkylation. You can buy 50 million benzyl bromides, alkylate all day, Jack Klingman it away, and you get out the product. Now, this is a good medicinal chemistry approach. The process chem, you don't like it, Hannah. I just don't think you can ever get monoalkylation in a system like that, but I guess med chemists don't really. Monobenzylation, you mean? Yes. Oh. Yeah, just controlling the amount of base. Sure, you can. Yeah. Mono, monobenzylation is fun. Yeah. Yeah, trust me. Yeah. You can. It, it, it'll stop at mono. I mean, if you, if you force it all day, it'll go to this. So don't worry about that. I mean, it's a good concern, but once you slide finder, you'll see. Monoalkylation is fine. Now, the problem with the MedChem approach is the alkylation. Isopropylation of an indole is a not great reaction at all, as you can imagine. The yield is very low. So for process chemists, they're going to have to throw this out the window completely. Process chemists are good. Now we'll go back to Steve. So process chemists are going to use Steve's disconnection.
and they're, they're going to need to formulate somehow. So if you use that, it's going to turn this into <coughs> which you can see can just be an aldol product away to your product. And this is just, what do we treat this with? Our favorite reagent? Vilsmeyer, yeah. So we POCl3 this one, turns it into the Vilsmeyer. Nice, efficient formulation. After workup, you lose this stuff here. Methyl aniline, you lose that, and that's your product. Okay, now we need a good way to make that. And luckily, just where we need it is problem of the day number four. There it is. Problem of the day number four. Uh, Tucker has kindly... Uh, volunteered himself. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Okay, he's got money on SN2. Let's see here. All right. That sounds good. There you go. And then? And then eliminate off the... Eliminate off the what? Water. Perfect. That is called the Bischler. Remember the Bischler when we talked about benzothiophenes? They did that wicked rearrangement from C3 to C2. No such problem exists with indole. What you see is what you get. Remember the Bischler with benzothiophenes? It was just a couple weeks ago. Nick remembers. Thank you. Good. One out of 30 is not bad. The advantage of this one is strategic and obvious. You buy your isopropyl. We don't have to alkylate. And why is this a process rel? Well, strategically, they only have to make one compound. There's no diversity involved. So if you look at this in a sort of sophomoric way, and you say, oh, the process chemists are much better. No. They're much worse if they want to make diversity. This is a terrible route if you want to make a million compounds. Okay, great. Anybody take melatonin? Looks like several. Does it do anything for you, Max? Actually, yeah. Some people, it does something. Some people, it has no effect Placebo at all. Placebo effect is strong. Placebo effect, yeah. It also tastes really good. It comes with strawberry flavorization. That is not the taste of the melatonin. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a little gummy. Yeah. 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 I used to take it for jet lag, but it just makes you—you you wake up and you feel sort of disoriented, and it doesn't help my natural state. Crazy dreams. Crazy dreams. Oh, we'll talk about crazy dreams in just a minute. <laughs> I don't think they call those dreams. Wait, is it bicycle? What's that? I was asking if it was bicycle. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear you. Because of LSD? Oh, no, no, it's not controlled. Melatonin is not controlled. It's also not psychedelic, and I'll get into that in a minute. It doesn't really have much of an effect as far as giving you, you know, you can't, re you, you can't really OD on this stuff. I mean, I guess you could, but... Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, you can OD on, on water, even, so, I mean, but, yeah, it doesn't have much of an effect. So how do we make this stuff? Treat tryptamine with lead tetraacetate. That sounds great. So one approach is just be start from doing ring substitution. So Saul knows that tryptamine is super cheap and available, and this position should be oxidizable. So just treat with an oxidant. That's a good approach. Nothing wrong with that. Option two, do a gribble reduction to tryptamine, and then treat with electrophilic oxygen. 
any time. Like make it in the league. And the gripple conditions are what, Saul? Or yeah, normal. So like saying more hydride, yeah. acetic acid. Maybe yeah. The triethyl silane TFA is better. Okay. Everybody know how that works? Pyrol Max. I wasn't actually paying attention to what Saul was saying. Could you <laughs> it's a good <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how does the gribble reduction work? If I take a, if I take an indole and I treat it with acid and then a reducing agent, how do you think that happens? Um, C3 protonation, just like a pyrrole, exactly. C3 protonation, and then hydride comes in, and that's the end of the story. Uh, indolines are pretty easily oxidizable back up to indoles. Um, we'll talk about some mechanisms about that on Wednesday. But yeah, doing that is nice because it gives you a gateway into aniline reactivity. And what it does is it protects the 2, 3 pi bond. It's gone. So you no longer have to worry about it. And then you turn an indole into an aniline. It's just an aniline now. So you can do the reactivity and types of reactions that you're all sort of happy with there. We have another approach to make this stuff. Could you open the Okay. Yeah. Well, sure, you could. You could treat it with, like, ethyl magnesium bromide to make the magnesium anion, and that'll go to C3. Open up the aziridine. Oh, that's right, from benzophenone. Well, if you want to skip ahead to the Nanetsky, which we haven't gotten to, um, you'll need some sort of uh, group here to stabilize it. We'll get to Nanetsky in a minute. So hold Saul's thought. Uh, when we get to Nanetsky, I'm going to return back to this one and, and talk about how you would do the, that, what he's talking about in this context. We, of course, need a way to make that. So what you've done by alkylating is just a further problem to later. I mean, I assume you could buy it from Aldrich, but uh, for the purpose of the class, we need to make it. The problem with Bartoli, and we will get into that, I, don't, I think we'll talk about Bartoli tomorrow or Wednesday. Yeah, in this case, it should work fine. So we'll talk about the mechanism of Bartoli, I guess, on Wednesday. That should be fine. Or you could use Batchko Lime Gruber again. You could also do Fisher, too. You could do a Fisher as well. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think for just really cool. Aha, you could do a fissure for the main target. Yeah, the main target, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I think it's like they had this example in uh, the book where they had like, I think a, what was it? Like a Prolody type electrophile for the, and then it just kind of ring opens halfway through the fissure to keep the side chain on there. It's Prolody, right? And you more oxidation state. So, so um, Max has identified the way they made it on kilo scale. This is Dr. Reddy's lab in India. And so after they do the Jap Klingman fissure, they get out this, which they then decarboxylate. And I'm going to get back to it, so I'll relax. Yeah. We'll, we'll talk about the context of Nidiscu in just a moment. But yeah, you might say, this is a really you know, strange way to make it, but it's very, very inexpensive to do it this way. Is there another disconnection? Like, what is the most favorite disconnection for indoles by medicinal chemists in the modern era? I'm surprised nobody said it. Especially shocked you didn't say it, so. What, what, so who said it? The rock, yeah. So an easy way to make this stuff would just be... Is that reaction going to work well? No. no. Is it you said no? Yes? I said no. I, yes, I said no. 
Okay, and what do I need? Toss a TMS on that outcome. All right, let's put some silo on there. Usually people use uh, something a little bit more stable than TMS. They usually put TS or bigger things. But a TMS might work as well. And then upon workup, you treat it with HCL, and the intermediate C2 species you get is de proto desilated. So that the, the product you would get from Laroque would be a silo here. <clears throat> now, for super large scale, they didn't want to do that. Avoid the palladium, and all of this can be done in a bucket. Questions? Okay. Yeah, what do you say there, Pablo? It is chat quick, quick disconnection. E, what is E? Is it acetyl? It can be also acetyl. It can be acetyl. So yeah. usually so one side is E, and E for electron drawing group or ester, the other side often will be that. So both are fine. Yep. <clears throat> but the acetyl falls off easier, so a lot of people use the acetyl. The acetyl, sorry, acetyl. Good question. How about uh, MDL compound on the right here? Thoughts on this disconnection? What do you say there, Vincent? I'd really like to disconnect the, uh, the C3 carbon. Let's get rid of that nonsense, right? Yeah. OK. So this looks like a great canova nozzle, doesn't it? And uh, probably further to what Vincent meant, you, want, you can get rid of the aldehyde as well, can't yeah. you? Using just formaldehyde. Well, or, or, well, uh, formaldehyde will give us a different oxidation sorry, state. Yeah. Um, Favorite way to formulate in the world? Vilsmeyer. Now you know, Vincent. Thanks. <laughs> How do we make this thing? Quick and dirty? Can Jess, any quick and dirty ways of making this thing? Uh, uh, sorry, I can't hear you. Condensation. Okay, let's con let's uh, let's imagine what kind of condensation we want to do here. That's always you know when somebody asks how do you make a heterocycle and you say condensation, that is a great answer because it can mean <laughs> <laughs> it can mean almost anything, right? Because most heterocycles are made you you condense you lose water. So, all right. I'm going to condense, and let's do a Fisher style. <clears throat> Super easy, and it takes advantage of the inherent symmetry. There's only one region of isomer you can get. This is, I guess, uh, if look through the 2019 lens, this is CH functionalization, isn't it? Chang is like, how dare you? All right, so uh, we're, we're, we're more than halfway through, and no one has, no one has to my eyes, yawned yet, which is good. Uh, but it probably makes sense for us to go into the psychedelic zone. Does anyone know Alex Shogun? Some people do. He was at San Francisco State. He's the person who um, really identified MDMA as a, a useful substance, it actually is pretty useful. Like vets who come home from the war undergo MDMA treatment, and it's like life changing. People who have been in traumatic experiences, also they use them at parties sometimes. Don't recommend that. This is none of these compounds is MDMA. That's for a different uh, 
different lecture. Maybe someone else will give you. So he, he wrote two books. One of them is called PCAL, and the other one is called TCAL. And PCAL is uh, phenylalanine, uh, phenyl uh, ethylamines I have known and loved. And this one is tryptamines I have known and loved. It's a pretty big book, and it's a rather remarkable thing. He, he wrote this book with his wife, Anne, and how it went was, it was a, he was a pretty well-known pharmacologist, and how it went was he would ingest the substances, he would make them. In this book is basically org sin level preps for all the compounds. Hundreds of, of tryptamines are in here with their org sin level prep. So you could buy this book in a garage and you could make this stuff. I don't suggest doing that, but the full procedures, org sin level, are in here. And then after that, most people just report a melting point in NMR. <laughs> Some people in the 60s, if you look at old JRC papers, they even told you how it tasted. That's very cute. Uh, he takes it a little bit further. So um, he, he describes each of these compounds taken orally and then injected and then finally smoked. Yes. So let's go through this first compound here. First, we need to know how to make it. So I want two roots to make this compound. Uh, root number one would be. Let's take tryptamine and alkylate the shit out of it. Yes, tryptamine alkylation. Or. Reductive. Sorry. Or reductive amination. Reductive amination from. The, oh no, we need something even simpler. Let's start from something simpler even. chloride, you'll get that. You can then add any amine you want in there. And then LAH it down. And all four of those compounds are made through the similar route, either starting from the 5-hydroxy indole or from indole itself. <clears throat> that first compound uh, evokes Rather interesting images. Uh, <clears throat> he said, this compound, which we refer to as diisopropyl tryptamine, was like the body of Satan. <laughs> the voices of people were extremely distorted. Males sounded like frogs. Children sounded like they were w talking through synthesizers to imitate outer space people in science fiction movies. In fact, I felt that I was somehow sent into an anti-universe where everything looked the same as normal, but it was cold and empty imitation. I felt I was a fallen angel. <laughs> you know, it's amazing that you can simply take isopropyl and turn it into propyl. And um, what happens is he was, in this case, led by the hand of a wise old man who I know was God. <laughs> And we went off to the front of the synagogue. I was handed a Torah for me to carry as a sign that I had been accepted and forgiven and that I had come home. How much did he take? <laughs> You're just asking out of curiosity, right? To, to meet God... <laughs> so to, to meet God, he needed to take 100 milligrams intramuscularly. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of doses in here. Uh, you know, it's interesting when you then switch, you just add one hydro, one, you know, methoxy and uh, a dimethyl. This is 5-methoxy-DMT. Uh, uh, Many of you have probably heard of DMT, particularly if you listen to Joe Rogan's podcast. <laughs> probably nobody. Okay. I'm, I'm further ahead in popular culture than you guys, it looks like. Anyway, 15 mix of this stuff smoked. Uh, I beheld every thought was going on everywhere in the universe and all possible realities. Uh, while I was wrecked out with this horrible, ruthless love. It scale scared the hell out of me. When I could see again, 15 minutes later, <laughs> it was almost as if an echo of a thought in my head saying that I was given an extremely rare look into the true consciousness of it all. I've never been hit that hard since then. A definitely, a definite plus, 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 plus. That meant <laughs> really good, apparently. And then the kicker of them all, you know, you just 
it's amazing. I mean, this is the power of MedChem. Switch the dimethyl to the pyrrolidine. And um, in just only four milligrams, smoked. Uh, I remember the pipe, the inhalation, and with the pouring of a small glass of scotch, I settled down in front of the TV to watch a rerun of Star Trek. Everything seems normal. That was it. I came to some time later in the front room of a professional ally of mine who had, by chance, discovered me walking down the street near his house. <laughs> I do not recall, nor have I been able to regain any memories of the time I was out there. I apparently experienced no physical discomfort from the drug. In fact, I distinctly remember feeling very comfortable when I awoke. Clearly, this compound is some weird ass sh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, 900 pages of this. If, if you want to borrow it, it's my office. I think you can still get it from Amazon. They're, they're pretty amazing books. How many compounds did you actually go through? There, there's at least 100 in here. Just of the, just of the tryptamines. How, how did you know not to o o overdose? So what he would do, if you look at the procedures, he would start very gradually. One, you know, one mig, two migs. <laughs> Very gradually. And then, he would, you know, some of the early doses, like, no effect, it's fine. Actually, there's a section of melatonin in here. And basically, he said, you know, I think he took up the 300 megs. He's like, ah. He basically said, this stuff is worthless. Didn't even make me sleepy. And probably this is just a placebo effect, as so Saul said. So I think the craziest part of this story is after he published these books, the DEA threatened to arrest him. And but it, instead chose to hire him because... <laughs> eventually arrested him. No, they, well, they, they raided his lab. Yeah. They, they gave him a huge fine, but they actually, when they did all the investigation, he was cleared. They, he hadn't done nothing wrong. But he's now like a consultant. He to, passed away, but yeah. Restrict, or I guess for yeah. the last 10 years, he was a consultant to restrict commodity chemicals. Yeah. Because he would basically propose routes to illicit drugs and be like, people are going to need methyl amine, or people are going to need this or that. I mean, that's how they see the rules. Yeah. But he's also a hero among some. Uh, Anyway, we're not done talking about psychedelics. We'll actually cover, I guess, another one probably on Wednesday. You can guess what the structure of that one is. Uh, let's talk about more tryptamines because we know everybody loves them. Uh, so problem of the day number five is a clinical candidate. And um, the way they made it, so if you look at the front page of your handout, there's a clinical candidate. And they made it starting from this very simple homologated tryptophal. So problem of the day number five asks all the ways one might put together uh, this homologated tryptophan. So let's see if anyone can actually get the way that the process chemists made it. This is an OPRD. I think there was like 30 authors in this paper. Can we still do it one step? You want to do it in one step from what? Um, All right, well, Max has got it. I think it's the exact example might have been in the book. But, um, yeah, in the So are you implying you dared to read the book? <laughs> well, the fluorine. The fluorine's not an example, but... <clears throat> Perfect. Yeah. In uh, dihydropyran, pretty cheap. Count the carbons, they're all there. It's just a homologated version of the one we saw right here. Somewhere around here. There it is. Other ways of putting this thing together? Laroc. Same trick with the TMS. Okay, Laroc. Could do that, but um, not not so recommended. Uh, you know, the, the other the other thing you can imagine doing is just breaking here, and then doing some sort of Friel crafts followed by reduction, and that would lead us down the road of non Aldrich ways of obtaining that. 
we've covered a few already. Um, so for instance, we've already covered that one. We've already covered Bartoli. We've already covered um, Madelung. Sort of deprotonation, that position becomes rather acidic. What would you say the best R group is for that? Sorry? What? CF3. Well, the CF3 will then give us this compound. It's not what we want. So what do we need here? Hydrogen sounds good to me. Just make the formamide. Why are you scared of formamides? Don't be scared of formamides. <clears throat> Just NHCHO, treat it with Buley, and you'll get out your desired product. <clears throat> Other ways of installing the side chain. If you don't want to do the Friedel Crafts follow-up reduction, you could also just do uh, a direct HEC reaction using an acrylate followed by full reduction. And the palladation takes place because the indole is nucleophilic and palladium-2 is electrophilic. And so you get a C3 palladation. It then does a HEC reaction, and then you do a full reduction of the product. That is CH. Is it functionalization or activation? you got to ask Kiri. I'm going to vote for functionalization because that electrophilic palladation sounds like a Friedel Crafts to me. But anyway, if you search the literature, you'll probably find 10,000 papers that refers to that as a CH activation. Okay, great. Questions? What happens when you've got a fully carbocyclic, almost fully functionalized indole, like this Lily example? This one looks like quite a beast, doesn't it? So what's the first in this initial disconnection that I can do to get rid of some of the most uh, obvious functionality? Nick, any ideas? Uh, perhaps disconnect at uh, C3. Yeah, you we'll can't go wrong doing that. We can also get rid of this thing here. Thoughts on how to put this together? And so you've deferred the problem to a site bindering of how to make that aniline so that you can convert to the hydrogen. Can that methyl just come from an ester? Sorry? Can the methyl come from like an ester or an acid? Just like exhaustive reduction. What does that do for you? Well, it just kind of matches substitution patterns we've talked about a little bit more. <coughs> just C2 ester. Remember, well, we can just put NH here. Remember that when you have ester there, it's really synonymous with methyl, because we already learned in lecture one or two 
that when you have a pyrrole and you reduce it, getting a full reduction all the way to the methyl is super easy because of those quinomethide-like intermediates. So an ester can be brought very easily down to the methyl. That brings us down into a territory that we might say we can do Tucker's disconnection, but now there's other things we can do. <clears throat> we haven't talked about this yet, but there are ways of disconnecting here. And this can be extremely useful, particularly uh, when you're making heterocycles that you've never seen before, that are bridged, fused, bicyclic, tricyclic. This is the Hemmetsberger. And the Hemmetsberger can be done in its canonical state with just heat in xylene, high temperature. But in its more modern manifestation, people use rhodium catalysis to render it something that can be done at just room temperature of 50 degrees. And the scope appears to be more wide with that. And this is a legitimate CH activation. So you go through a vinyl nitrine, and it does CH insertion. If you instead... So if instead you reverse the polarity, meaning you put azide here and you have hydrogen there, that is also known. It's called the Sunberg. And the Sunberg is rarely employed just because, as you can imagine, it's not so simplifying. Best used in cases that are rather exotic, of the type that we'll talk about in 10 or more lectures from now. Sometimes it can be useful. Now, how do you make this thing? Well, this thing just comes from here. And this just comes from a formulation of a simple indane. A lot of ways to make indanes that are easy. In this case, you can buy that indane. <coughs> you formulate it. It goes away from the substituent. So formulation takes place cleanly here. And then you do your Hemmetsberger. So this one is sort of, again, the sort of thing I talked about at the beginning of having optionality comes into play again. If you'd only sort of gone through what we talked about before, you would say, well, why do we need to know more than just Fisher and Laroque and Bartoli and just a couple you really need to know, but it's not true because often your disconnection is guided by what is available. And so this is a starting material guided approach. So strategically, this one makes sense because you can buy and make lots of indane very easily. The formulation takes place really well. And so the, the most tactically simplifying disconnection is the CH bond here rather than disconnecting here. Like, this doesn't buy you anything because I don't know how to make this easily. But this one is easy. Questions? All right, there is a uh, rare little reaction for making indoles that appears only Saul knew called the Nenetskyu. And the Nenetskyu is only useful for one substitution, just 5-hydroxy tryptophans, or indoles. And it involves taking an a, a imine of some sort and um, reacting with quinone. And the product you get is the 5-hydroxy derivative. And you can imagine mechanistically that this goes via followed by loss of water. So if you see a 5-hydroxy indole, think Nenetsky, because benzoquinone is free. And then if we take the Nenetsky disconnection and go all the way back over here to melatonin, we have strategically carved out room on the board for Sol right here. And uh, 
this would require what people usually do to stabilize that enamine. is you put some ester group here. The reason you don't need a stabilizing group here, I mean, you kind of have it. This is a really complex structure if you look at the front page of the handout. And it can really only, it makes the amine, it's stable, and it can really only uh, enolize that direction. Whereas the aldehydes in a NETSQ are often messy because they like to self-condense a lot. So what people will often do is use this one. That would give you this product with hydroxy here and a benzyl there. Just need to remove the benzyl or whatever group you decided to put on there, and then methylate here. So that's how NNSQ could be used to make melatonin derivatives. Questions? All right, super. Let's talk about problem of the day number six. Oh, not yet. Sorry. My mistake. First, we need to talk about eMERGE. So this one, we're going to talk about MedChem versus process, and then finally, the grand finale radiochemists are going to come into the ring. So eMERGE, how do you make this stuff? How about the MedChem route? What's the quick and dirty way to make this through MedChem? Uh, sorry, a what? Uh, alkylation with like Well, so what Max has identified is the process route. So process is going to disconnect this. They see this as basically arising from a heck disconnection, followed by NC2 hydrogenation. And then if you treat this with base, just KOH is enough. And then acid workup, it will attack here. It will give you the olefin after dehydration. You'll do your HEC. At the end of your HEC, you bubble in H2. And it will reduce the olefin here and the olefin here. And you get out the product. Super fast. <sighs> The med chemists didn't want to do this because not all uh, ketones are going to react so smoothly. And for each analog you make, you don't want to have to do another reduction, right? So the med chemist took a, an approach of just using a fissure. Yield is only about 20%, but that's a great yield in their world. Okay, that's MedChem versus process on eMERGE. Now we have problem that in number six, which is you have to break down eMERGE. Remember everything I taught you in lecture three or whenever that was when we talked about radiochemistry. I need you to take the C2 carbon and put a C14 label there. So let's draw the structure. And uh, we need to identify someone that's going to help us with this. Uh, hmm. Sarah, any thoughts there? Let's, uh, let's, you can keep thinking. I'm just going to draw out here. This guy is going to need to be C14 label. That's eMERGE, right? Yes, good. Give us some thoughts. Just It can be just general thoughts. You're the radiochemist in the trenches. What, what are you going to do first as the radiochemist? First step.
first step is let's find the inventory of what we got to start with. So we need good one carbon sources. Can you jog our memory on what are some good sources that we can think about? We've got some formaldehyde, we've got some carbon monoxide, we've got some CO2. Anything else? Um, we got some cyanide hanging out there. Probably enough. These are our starting materials on the reagent side. Step two is the radiochemist. Now what do you do? You've identified your starting materials on the reagent side, and then what? You need to do another inventory, right? We need to know what do the process chemists have. Well, they obviously have the final product in unlimited quantity. And as a radiochemist, you're not going for elegance. You're going for a low step count with hot intermediates. So you don't want to make a waste stream. And if your yield is 2% and you get 10 MIGs, you keep your job. So radiochemists are going to view this problem, and they're going to say, can we intercept any intermediate that's sitting in the process line, number one? Or can we simply degrade and reconstitute our, our product? That's also a fair game. Take the bromo you want to take the bromo window? What do you want to do with that bromo window? back as we go. Oh, you want to go to the MedChem approach? If we go to the MedChem approach, we're going to need to make this thing radio labeled. Well, can you like calculate um, the papyridone and just make the wrong label but from the simpler? Can you do a fissure in the old Yeah, if you do a fissure that's going to require that we, we take multi-step sequence to make this label. And if you start here, you unfortunately have only C12 in that starting material. So can anyone identify a way of degrading and reconstituting? Would you like to oxidatively cleave the C2, C3 bond? Aha! Place the formal with the label? Well, let's open it up first and see what happens next. So after we open it up with, let's say, uh, pariodate, we'll get this, which has a name, actually. Anybody know what that thing is called? Any chemical biologists around here? Where are the chemicals? There's no chemical biologists? No, one, no chemical biologists here? How do you do chemical biology without knowing heterocycles? How do you do that? All right, I guess they can. This is a formal kynurinine, and it's actually an amino acid. So if you take tryptophan and you make the oxidative product, it's called kyn kynurinine, and that's a active, it's an, in your body currently. Your body makes these things. Kynurinine. I think that's how you spell it. A lot of drug, uh, a lot of, you know, the recent uh, IDO compound fury that was out there for immuno-oncology. That was like a lot of, lot of money exchanging hands for that, regardless of how good or bad it might have been. Uh, that was based upon a mechanism where the body takes trip uh, indoles and oxidizes them to kynurinines. So that's like chemical biology, isn't it? Anyway. All right, so we've done what you want, Hannah. We've opened it up. Now what do I do? I've got my starting materials here that I can use. And now I need ways to reconstitute it. You'll note that the carbon that eventually needs to be C2 labeled has now uh, just sort of dangling off by a thread. So how do I use the starting materials there to reconstitute and save the day? Any ideas? C2, 
something you can do with the cyanohydrin. Let's just, let's just do it and see what happens. So if we treat this with cyanide, you'll get the cyanohydrin. And the hope would be some process like that, which we could hopefully use Gribble or some other reducing agent to get product. So that's it. Hannah, having no clue how to radio label this, reasoned it out just by guessing from starting materials and degrad degradation. That's all you would need to do. Right? This gets you to the point of SciFinder. <sighs> Pretty nifty. All right, let's take a look at Maxalt really quickly. You can, we're, we're you know, I promised we would end early, but you guys are so much fun that um, it's hard to end early with you guys. But these ones are quick. Uh, anybody want to, Gigi, how about uh, give, us, give us our answer here. Quick, quick way to make this. Medcam or process, whatever you like. It's sort of a summary of everything we've done. So it's just speed, speed into all synthesis. OK, great. And then what do you want what do you want me to put there? Maybe a bromide. Uh, bromide where? On the on the left. Yeah, yeah, we can put anything there. Sure, don't worry. I'll just put R. I want to know how you make the indole. Maybe that one. Larox sounds good to me. Perfect. How about this one from Lily? Can you call it out? It's got an interesting motif on it. Uh, Chang? 5 methoxy corresponds to the alcohol. Corresponds to what? I can't say the name. It's too complicated. Yeah, uh, it took me many years. The NITSQ. <laughs> yeah. All right, great. Problem of the day number seven. <clears throat> This one you can just call out, Nick. Um, I'm not sure very well. Is it a nitro or? Oh, that's an amino iodide. And I want to convert it to that. It's probably day number seven, if you want to look at the handout. First one. Just give me the reagent. which is not Lorac, by the way, because I didn't put the silo group on there. So when I put the silo group on there, the phenyl would be here and the silo would be there. But if I just do a heck alkynation, the phenyl goes the here, yeah. and the heck alkynation, which if you add copper is Sangashira, gives you that. All right, how about this one? This one's a quick one. Zhang, you want to call it out? step way to do that. This is like your multiplication charts when you were a kid. 
Like these transformations need to be like bam, bam, super quick. Interview questions when you go to a company, they could show this on the board to you. And it needs to be like you don't even, you, you sleep while you're sleeping, you tell them. Madelon, yes. So just treat this with base and you're done. Perfect. And the last one. How do we get there? And I don't want you to say iodinate followed by. No, no, no. The best way to put this one together would be through what is known as a gasman. So the gasman involves. Some chlorinating source, usually T butyl hypochlorite, you expose the aniline to that. The aniline then goes to the N chloroadduct. This sulfur then attacks at the aniline. And the intermediate is after deprotonation. <coughs> And this does a Sommelet Hauser rearrangement. And after closure and loss of water, the product you get from it is this. Which you can remove the sulfur from just by treating with rainy nickel. If you use, instead of a phenyl there, a corresponding ester, you'll get out your oxindol. You see that? So here would be O. That will give you your oxindol. Gasman is super useful. Very mild, pretty practical. People have scaled up Gasman. Well, that's it. We have three minutes left, which is perfect, because we have to talk about the consulting problem. Um, so the <laughs> consulting problem is uh, not not the easiest. How do we move this up? Here we go. Because it's so darn general. And and so and, and the other problem with this problem is that there are many things we haven't learned yet. So how we're going to proceed here is I'm going to give you a few thoughts. David will proceed, um, uh, we'll, we'll follow up with actual references. But given this alpha iodo ketone in your hand, uh, the way you would make some of these things where I assume X, Y, or Z can be, even be carbons, doesn't really matter. Uh, I would go for uh, the fastest and cheapest way to interrogate SAR. So as we talked about in lecture number four, uh, there are only four general ways of making heterocycles. And you've got a bis electrophile here, so you need a bis nucleophile. So the bis nucleophiles that come to mind almost immediately are this. This one would give you, we haven't learned this stuff yet. This one would give you the oxazole, that would give you the imidazole, and that would give you the thiazole, <coughs> and allow you to generate all of these from carboxylic acids or nitriles. And that would give you rise to species like that. The other possible, or y is equal to carbon. The other possibility here is to take this guy and convert it
and then reverse the polarity. Now you go back to lecture four and you look, now you have nucleophile electrophile and you need to find nucleophile electrophile pair. So <clears throat> If one, let's say, turn this into you could oxidatively close this to the corresponding product. Similarly, where R is equal to some sort of carbonyl here, this would snapshot as well. And um, presumably you could make that type of, this is an aminazole strategy that could be made also from the ketone directly by taking a, a halo carbonyl and coupling it with here up, uh, to close it the opposite way. So for instance, if you took this one and you treated it with a nitrile, You would get attack here followed by closure. Uh, let's see if we have other ones. Does that capture what I emailed you? Only a few examples of the second row? Oh, yeah, I'm glad you re reminded me of that one. Yeah, so you can also take this one and do a reductive amination on it to make the diamine. And then the diamine can be merged with 100 different things to give you either the aromatic or one oxidate, the azoline oxidation state. But what would be good is to get some granularity on really the exact compounds you need, what, what X and Y and, and Z actually are. Because of that marker structure that you draw there, which is a typical thing you would see in the patent literature, there, there's not an infinite number of compounds that's chemically feasible. So some of those X, Y, and Z need to be particular atoms for it to be actual, actually feasible. Um, you know, this, would, this would get you into triazole territory. Uh, but yeah, um, so David will send you the references on this, and maybe it would make sense to revisit some of these again when we talk about Azoles and particularly triazoles. But any thoughts from, is this from Ren or Patrick? Or? Lily. Yeah. Lily. Any, any thoughts here on reasonable? Yeah, yeah they're all really reasonable. Uh, R would be arrow. R is arrow. Oh, that's good. Uh, the other thing to do would be, you could, if you made the alpha, I think this is probably known, if you make the alpha azido ketone, you can convert the alpha azido ketone into the parent triazole. And then take that triazole and use different alkylating conditions. So you can either arylate here or here just by changing the ligand. So you can use the buckwald ullman goldberg reaction on, the, on where X, Y, and Z is equal to nitrogen. And then depending on your ligand, either get alkylation here or here. It's probably not going to go next to that T-butyl group. But I think the alpha azido ketone can be isomerized into the triazole. Did you find a reference for that? Did we look? Okay. All right, great. It's a great question. So uh, we will see you on Wednesday for more indole and as indole fun.